we're going to start with our resident historian, Alessa, who's going to quickly, Alessa, if you could explain to us something that you frequently write, which is that the war that we all speak about, the war, the invasion of Ukraine, um, which Western journalists tend to say started in February of 2022, in fact, started in 2014. Could you explain that to us? Thank you so much for um, having us here and for having this really important discussion. It's really important that we keep talking about Ukraine at the moment, in particular when Putin is escalating this war even further and continues to terrorize the Ukrainian population, as we've seen over the last few days. Every single day, we have severe bombardment of absolutely residential areas and people continue to die. So thank you, first of all. No pressure. Okay, let's talk about the, the, the easy things to start with. Well, yeah, it, it is actually quite straightforward. The war did begin in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea and the start of occupation of parts of what is sometimes referred to as Donbass, eastern Ukraine, right? I mean, the, the hostilities started immediately. Occupation was Crimea, was a violation of international law. We did not respond. We, I mean, we as the West did not respond appropriately to it. Had we responded appropriately, maybe we wouldn't have found ourselves in this situation. Essentially, Putin saw that as green light, that he can escalate it, so he continued to escalate. And in the meantime, we continued to do business as usual with Russia. We continued to purchase oil and gas in the West funding this war. So when I hear people say, I, we, you know, some countries, some states saying, we don't want to be involved in this war any further because, you know, we don't want to uh, get engaged uh, as uh, members of NATO or so on. It, it's, it's sort of, you know, disingenuous a little bit because those countries have been involved in this war by financing that war, by purchasing oil and gas and being reliant on it. But I'd just like to touch upon, yeah, and since that time, before the 24th of February 2022, 14,000 people were killed. And it was essentially a forgotten war in Europe, right? People, when I spoke about it, when I wrote a book about it, when I, I, I had a documentary play about it, because um, my brother was killed at the front line in 2017. So at the time, people thought that there was no war, that it was finished. And when I mentioned it, they were surprised. But I'd like to quickly comment because I think it, yeah. Yes, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about how this misunderstanding of history has been weaponized in this war and why it's particularly important for Western audiences to kind of alter their knowledge. And I'd quickly like to read a quote um, from an article you wrote titled, Writing Ukraine, You Write. The sudden appearance of Ukraine in the limelight has not yet brought about a better understanding of the country and that what we need is a permanent alteration, decolonization, de-imperialization of our knowledge. So what does this de-imperialization of our knowledge look like and why is it so important? Uh, excellent questions, very important questions as well. So yeah, I think the knowledge has definitely improved over the last eight months, uh, but it's, so before that it was just a black hole, I think, in lots of people's mental maps. Uh, it's no longer a black hole. We know what Ukraine is not most of the time, because we know that it's not Russia. We know that Russophone Ukrainians are not Russians. We know that Ukraine should, is not really in the Russian sphere of influence. It's an independent country that wants sovereignty and so on. But we still don't quite know where Ukraine actually is. But rather than giving you centuries of history, which I have no intention of doing, I'd like to point out a couple of things about weaponization of history. And I'm really glad you used that word, because it's not just misuse. It's not just abuse. It's weaponization of history by the Kremlin. And um, what do I mean by that? There's a, Timothy Snyder, who's, I recommend all of his work, is also at the moment doing YouTube series of his lectures, so you can, you know, prepare your dinner and listen to him, educate you about Ukraine if you wish. Um, he's a historian uh, of, of that region, uh, an American uh, historian based in Yale. And he, when Putin issued that uh, 5,000 word declaration of war, that essay, uh, in July before, you know, July 2021, before the attack in the summer, um, Putin, um, Snyder referred to it, I think, as something like, I'm paraphrasing now, that, you know, when you read it as a historian, you, f you feel like you're, an, you know, you're a zoologist in an abattoir. You can see the pieces of animals, you should be able to make sense of it but it's not the animal, you know? So it's a weapon of war. And as historians, there's been a consensus, I think, among a lot of us to not engage with it as even pseudo history, because it isn't. It's, it's a weapon of war. It's a justification of contemporary violence. And, and do you think engaging with it as this kind of pseudo history would in some way legitimize it? Exactly, precisely. And one thing that we, and again, Snyder does this, we should point out is that when people use, when Putin uses and his cronies use words such as 
always that part of territory always belonged to Russia, we should be wary because that is imperialist colonial way of talking about. It. Having said that, we can learn from history quite a lot. Um, so not weapon weaponized history, but history as such. And one thing, and this is this is just one thing that I'd like to throw out there and let everybody else speak is Ukraine, there's been a lot of admiration for Ukrainian defiance. Yeah, the house, how, how, you know, um, bravely they're fighting um, because the expectation was that the state would fall in three days. Um, that defiance doesn't appear overnight. You know, it, Ukrainians did not wake up on the 24th of February and thought, all right, we're going to be brave people. No, it's because we've had centuries of repressive statelessness. And then really complicated statehood, which we cherish because we know what it means, because statelessness means collapse of rule of law, subjugation and occupation, as we see now on the liberated territories, uh, you know, where there are mass graves, where there are torture chambers and all of that. So that's one thing we can definitely learn from Ukrainian history. And I'm so glad you're bringing all this up because this is going to bring us exactly into what I think is going to be the heart of the conversation tonight which is this question of what is Ukraine? You say, you know, we define Ukraine negatively as what is not Russia. And it becomes immensely important when you're confronting the violence of this war to have an understanding, as you said, a knowledge of this country, of its history, um, and to alter this knowledge that it's not um, kind of situated within the contours of this imperialist thought. And yet at the same time, you're faced with this impossible project of explaining this geographically immense um, culturally, ethnically, linguistically complicated, um, complex country, which has this really rich and diverse history, which is which is not known by kind of Western audiences. And so all of you have found yourself in situations where you are forced to explain, in a sense, what Ukraine is in these condensed, palatable narratives. Um, and I want to ask all of you about your experience of trying to articulate Ukraine. And I think there are two poles to this. So there's trying to articulate Ukrainian identity for oneself, understand what it is to be Ukrainian, and then trying to articulate that to this global audience that has suddenly been created by this war. Um, and I wanna start with Artem, who's on Zoom. Artem, um, in your story, The Ukraine, you use this Western tendency to incorrectly um, call Ukraine the Ukraine, adding this the, which is which is not actually necessary. Um, and you use this as a way to explore the possibility of um, the essence of Ukraine, which you call the Dostoevsky. You write that there is Ukraine as such, and there is in fact also a. Um, and so I want you to tell us what is the Ukraine? Thoughts. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for the probably bad connection, like I'm now on a train and using mobile internet, so uh, there may be some issues with connection. Yeah, uh, speaking about what Ukraine is, uh, I was trying to present it uh, maybe a little bit as opposed to these um, propaganda images or these touristic images, like what Ukraine is for ourselves, yeah? Right, and um, I was writing about my experiences uh, and experiences of many other people of uh, basically living within Ukraine and seeing what it is uh, from inside. And um, I was trying not to idealize Ukraine, like now we can see some idealistic images, I was trying to basically uh, show Ukraine as it is, with all its, uh, that probably with the shortcomings, probably with uh, some things that we don't even like, but uh, we still love, you know? Uh, one of the main uh, issues of the, the book, The Ukraine, is about uh, loving, uh, even if you see uh, the, not perfect realities like uh, right now in in russian propaganda and sometimes i see it in uh, western media like especially in germany like because my wife is now in germany it's like that okay but ukraine was corrupt so why are we idealizing it yeah of course there were some shortcomings in ukraine but that doesn't make it uh, less of a country for us for example 
And I was trying to show that uh, Ukraine may be sometimes like this romance of decline, as I say, because uh, right now, because of the war, we have problems with water and uh, electricity sometimes, yeah? But I remember like growing up in the 90s and it was similar because of purely economical reasons. And uh, trying to incorporate all this, trying to incorporate all the shortcomings in the love of your country was uh, my main idea. So uh, we were trying to say like what Ukraine is not, yeah? like. I think for most of Ukrainians, definitely uh, Ukraine is not only not Russia. Putin is kind of correct in saying that Ukraine is anti-Russia. And uh, some of the things we can now uh, see is in this uh, defiance, is in this unexpected for many people, in, including for many Ukrainians, this unexpected uh, resistance. Like Putin, uh, he kind of modeled Ukraine based on Russia, I think. And so he thought that like when a stronger force attacks, people would run away. But instead what we are seeing, like people are running to the to the army, if we are talking about men. Like uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, like there was this uh, massive attack of drones and Putin was trying to terrorize Ukraine. Instead, what he got was like Ukrainians like quarreling between themselves whether it's allowed to shoot at the drones or not if you're not in the military so basically people are not only not afraid people are i would say energized and of course uh, this war is a great tragedy but uh, i think putin doesn't get it like uh, in Russia, it's well. I, I don't want to make generalizations about well, Russia. I, I'm, I'm going inter to inter interrupt you here, Artem, because um, in the interest of time, we have to let other people speak. But I am going to return to you later to ask you more about what we think that people are not getting about Ukraine, and that perhaps Russia, in particular, is not getting about Ukraine. But thank you for sharing this because you've brought up a really interesting point that we've also touched upon with Alessa, which is that what we're searching for here is this positive image of Ukraine as opposed to this negative one of what is what it is not. And one way that I see as a really powerful tool to construct these positive images of Ukraine is through the use of poetry, which is mythical, um, lyrical, symbolic, image heavy. Um, and so I wanna turn to Luba really quickly. And Luba, I wanna ask you how you undertake this project of representing Ukraine, of generating a positive image of Ukraine through your poetry and what images of Ukraine you think resonate the most in your poetic work? Um, my poetry is about civilian, um, civilian experiencing, how civilians experience in this war. And this is about daily life during wartime. Uh, I'm interested in ordinary people like uh, factory workers, miners, and just normal citizens. And um, this is uh, uh, very essential for me, actually, to give these people voices. And um, also, uh, my poetry is also about language changes, uh, changing during uh, the war, uh, ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, because language usually reflects life. And when life change, uh, changes rapidly, uh, language also changes. And um, uh, I understand that I can... Um, uh, show, uh, emphasize this uh, reality changes due, uh, using just language uh, to show uh, how uh, how um, work uh, this in language. I could give you an example. For instance, uh, um, maybe even in uh, English language, uh, because this war also uh, has. Uh, uh, impact on English language. Uh, recently, I uh, wanted to say uh, Putin went nuclear, uh, but uh, I just stopped because, um, uh, you know, uh, when Russia uh, doesn't um, use nuclear weapon, uh, this, uh, but we are threatened uh, by uh, Russia, um uh, this is uh, sound very um, more dangerous uh, more um 
worse than um, was worse than it is uh, right now and um, this is also uh, essential part of uh, uh, this war uh, language and um, I believe that we uh, can uh, show uh, these wars through poetry, through stories, not just like a tragic uh, thing, uh, not just like a tragic story, but also like a com comedy. Uh, and uh, probably you you heard uh, some uh, or you've seen some Ukrainian memes and uh, heard some Ukrainian joke about this war. And this also part of this war, uh, this uh, like vital, uh, vital and uh, uh, funny narrative, uh, which help us uh, to relieve uh, and uh, to, and uh, don't feel all the time this pressure. And uh, I also try to emphasize uh this uh, part of uh, this war so there's um it's interesting that you speak about you write about civilian life and that's really important to you in the work that you're doing there's an image that's um very powerful and very um heavily heavily used in africa to the Donbass, which is of course the apricot um you open this book with the line where no more apricots grow Russia starts. Could you explain to us this image of the apricot in your poetry and what this says to you about what Ukraine is, both as a country which is currently at war, but as a country which you grew up in, um, in which you you have these memories of your childhood, which are both cherished and beloved and also filled with conflict. So tell us a little bit about, about the apricots, please, the apricots. <laughs> uh, this is true because uh, apricots, uh, disappear uh, almost on the border with Russia and uh, um, when eastern part of Ukraine and the south part of Ukraine are under occupation uh, this apricots uh, this apricot trees uh, exist uh, so uh, Russia can occupy Ukrainian territories uh, temporarily of course uh, but this apricot uh, apricots uh grow grow on our territories and uh, this is like you know like a marker uh it i use uh, i use this to mark uh, uh, russia territories as uh, something dead and uh, they really are different uh, really really different there are lots of differences between ukrainian uh, territories and between Russia. It, it is also about relationship between people. Uh, we, uh, even today, I'm in Kyiv now, and uh, today Kyiv was fired by drones, by rockets, and uh, this is also part of uh, Russia culture. This is part of Russia archaic, archaic culture. Uh, this is part of Russian uh, relationship uh because this way in which russia uh like uh, provides this war in ukraine this is also part of uh, russia culture lots of book in books in ukraine are burned uh, ukraine just ukrainian books uh, uh people uh raped by russian occupiers and so on this maybe you heard uh, the stories about excrements in uh, ukrainian um uh, houses where russians uh, lived and uh, this is also part of russia uh, russian culture uh, which russia share on ukrainian territories and uh, uh, using apricots, just apricot tree, trees, I uh, tried to explain, tried to emphasize, tried to express uh, these differences between us. Mm, yes, and I think it's just such a powerful metaphor that, that the Ukrainian soil is the fertile soil, which is producing growth um, and which is producing kind of this hope for tomorrow in the form of these fruits, which will ultimately fall and create more more uh, more trees more fruits so it's a beautiful image thank you um and i love that it generates this image of of ukraine a ukraine that you know you've lived in that you are currently in um because this is going to help contribute to this search for for what ukraine might look like might be um there are these images of ukraine which we retain from our childhood from my life there 
There are also images of Ukraine, which we inherit in the form of memory through oral storytelling. Um, and these images are interesting because they might not necessarily even be truthful, and yet they also have this real truth to them because they are descended from lived experiences. So I want to turn to Sonia for this question. Um, Sonia, you write about hearing your grandmother tell stories about her village in Ukraine, that I grow into these images. Though I do not share them with strangers, they are what I think of when strangers ask me where I come from. So what are these images of Ukraine, which children of the diaspora inherit? And are they truthful? Hi, Emily, thank you so much for that question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. very well. Um, yeah, I guess maybe just for a little bit of context, you know, as a personal essayist, I would never say that I speak like for Ukraine or even that my images ne necessarily can capture or depict even any really like anything about Ukraine beyond my own positionality. Um, you know, as someone who exists at sort of the intersection of Ukrainian and American culture, I was raised in this sort of like hyper patriotic uh, Ukrainian diaspora community. My grandparents came to the U.S. as World War II refugees. Um, and I was like when I was raised, people told me constantly, like, you should identify as Ukrainian. You should tell people about Ukraine. Um, if people ask about your last name, make sure you tell them it's Ukrainian because they're going to assume that it's Russian, right? So this was kind of the milieu that I was I was raised in, um, which which I think if we look at history, we can see how it's the result of or reaction to oppression and to your culture being under threat. Um, but at the same time, I was born in the U.S. I hold an American passport, so even when I lived and worked in Ukraine, I was really there as a guest. Um, and and that experience of of living in Ukraine, and especially in 2014 when when the war started. Um, that that caused me to rethink my own Ukrainianness and eventually to sort of write about the liminal space that I feel as a as like a grandchild of the diaspora that I sort of inhabit. It's the space that's sort of haunted by earlier experiences of war and displacement. Um, like it's sort of haunted by Ukraine and by those images, like by the village that you just referenced. And at the same time, someone from my diaspora community might not necessarily have a super full or might have a rather limited understanding of contemporary Ukrainian life. And for me, that that became like a very kind of like problematic and confusing space to inhabit. Um, but I maybe you and ask, oh, yeah. did you see writing about Ukraine and this this image of Ukraine, the village of Ukraine as a form of exorcism then if you felt haunted by it or why? Why did you sit down to write about it? That's a great question. I mean, I guess, I guess just like obsession, like really trying to understand, um, yeah, trying to understand what, like what it was, why it felt like there was this sort of unspoken violence that was never directly looked at or spoken about in my family. And frankly, very rarely spoken about in the larger community, but it, but it's sort of like its effects were always there. It sort of felt ever present nonetheless. Um, but, but at the same time, there's also like a long history of Russian or rather Ukrainian resistance to Russian imperialism. That's part of that legacy too. Um, for example, like some of my earliest memories are of my grandmother reciting Taras Shevchenko's poetry by heart to me, even decades after she had lived in, in Chicago, she would like, I can still hear and feel the rhythm of like those opening lines of Katarina and how she would deliver them. And she would just be like cooking something and would be would be like saying this like you know this like reciting this decolonial poetry essentially um which is which i guess is to say that like i've been listening to that rhythm and hearing listening to ukrainian voices for a long time and that's something that i think is like really important in this moment right when we're sort of talking about like how do, how is ukraine depicted to the world how do we explain ukraine or talk about ukraine when people are searching for Ukrainian voices, like I, I acknowledge and recognize that maybe I'm not um, totally equipped for that task. Like maybe I'm not the right person for that job, but I do have the practice of listening to Ukrainians. And I don't think that's something that can be taken for granted. I mean, in my view, we've seen through the full, like when the full scale invasion started, we've seen how many people and organizations and institutions had no practice of listening to Ukrainians, had never listened to Ukrainians, were not prepared to engage in deep listening with Ukrainians. 
Um, so for me, yeah, I guess that image of sort of like my grandmother, like telling stories and like repeating the poetry, um, that's also like a source of, of, of strength in this moment. Um, and I'm really putting that emphasis on sort of like the history and practice of listening as like where I see sort of my role at this current moment. I love I love what you're saying so much about this history and practice of listening and what it takes to actually learn how to listen because you're right there has been this just enormous call for this kind of the, the mythical the legendary Ukrainian voice as though one single homogenous Ukrainian vo voice ever really existed and there's been alongside that as you say this inability to listen to it and I think perhaps also this this results in the actual Ukrainian intellectuals, writers such as we have tonight who are being consulted to feel that they're not being heard. Um, I wanna talk to Irena here who's been sitting so patiently for half an hour um, because you wrote so eloquently in an article with Vanity Fair about this exact experience of constantly being demanded to explain yourself and to speak for an entire country when you are in fact just, just one, one very small member of it. Um, so you write uh, a voice from another reality, a French one, reaches me. Ah, well, yes. I had dreamed of having a few hours without having to explain the reality of Ukraine to a European, uh, I believe that says citizen. I should have put my mouth under lock and key. And I want to first of all address the irony that you are here tonight talking to European citizens about Ukraine. And I'm going to do the terrible thing, which is first I'm going to ask you about this experience of constantly having to explain yourself and then I'm going to ask you to explain Ukraine. So first, what is it like to constantly be asked this question? Well, uh, you you can get used to it, actually. You know, so actually, as soon as you open your mouth, people hear your accent. Like, hmm, where are you from? And you, oh my God, from Ukraine. Here we go. You know. So this is what happened actually in the in this article or in this village or some you know some monsieur who's like normally owning a quiet place in the countryside. He just has to question you on Azov. They are Nazis. You know. Yeah. You she, you can see her reaction, right? Like it's, it's such a such a pain in the neck for everyone of us like really to explain and uh you know one one more thing i remember now like i've been to ukraine for three times since the beginning of the war and for the first time i was so overwhelmed because it was the season of blueberries so of course i was doing blueberries like in ukrainian way with the sour cream and you know like such a great thing for for us for like uh, it's delightful. from childhood and i have a comment from some french person it's like it's also it's not so bad you know the war in Ukraine yes we still grew strawberries actually they're even wild you know so like they don't ask for permission you know like for international community or of, of being, you know, of being there like grow. yes and I was actually angry. Yes, we still eat in Ukraine. We still, you know, sing. We still drink. We still like, you know, okay, we can go to bomb shelters. But as soon as we come out, our kids have like their heads washed. Because this is Ukrainian resilience. It's what Alessa said, like through all the years and decades and centuries, we like we had a... We, just didn't have a good luck with a neighbor, you know? So we were oppressed and oppressed and oppressed. So we had to be resilient. This is why we have these crazy colors in national, you know, uh, folkloric clothes. We have all this strichki, I don't know, like, yeah, ribbons and flowers and we have lots of frescoes of naive arts and we have uh, embroidery shorts this is because to show like no actually we like just just to make you angry we go going to live you know so this is the uh, cultural resilience food resilience by the way my ex-husband was from california his great grandmom was was from uh, um, ukraine Two things that remain when you're emigre of like lawn. So like it's what just to Sonia told us. It, it was like swearing, bad words, like sraka, you know, because all English words were prohibited at home. So like they had a right to swear in Ukrainian and food. So like th this is great because food is something that you can keep. And it's also a way to make a cultural diplomacy. You know, I don't know if you guys know what is Vareniki. It's sort of kind of dumpling, like uh, we call it a cuisine de survie, survival kitchen, because like 
like who can who else can put potato inside of a like a doll yes you know so just not to be hungry but still you can make a like a master class of vareniki for your parisian friends everybody loves it and what i it's also like too. it's I'm, I'm going to the to your next question yes. it's um for french people it's very easy to explain ukraine via uh cuisine you know because like uh, i i'm i'm not uh, i'm completely frank right now what I'm like for three times, I'm like eating and eating and eating when I come to Ukraine, mm -hmm. because for some reason I eat better there than in here. Since 2014, we had so many startups, like new restaurants, new places, like very young, dynamic people who go across the world, who, who can, who learn and they make a fusion. It's great. So I really, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm inviting you to visit Ukraine as soon as you can go. Uh, and like, it's, it's real. I'm going to Odessa in a couple of days. It was like, it still was. Was, uh, still is our one of our other gastronomical capitals and the coffee oh my mm -hmm. god we have the best coffee you the know like coffee. whoever lives in france you know my pain because like fred I, I don't understand french such a great nation with such a bad coffee oh so, like, careful but, know your audience <laughs> i know but they will agree with me yeah. so like you know it's not okay you can yeah you see you see people are nodding so like okay, yes. okay. We there's agree many many audience. great things like so if france has this uh, as you know Know, like main export product is um, l'art de vivre uh -huh. like ukrainians yes it's vitality it's resilience you know yeah. like yesterday we are bombed today they're like you know doing asphalt uh, like uh, yeah they fix the roads mm. you know like mm. people in Irpin whose houses were destroyed they are doing they cleaning they do themselves they they make like money collections so people just do not sit and cry mm. this is why we have all this humor Artem mentioned and yes. Luba mentioned yes. like even when something's ugly like this bridge glass bridge in Kiev everyone was like oh my god such an ugly bridge this Klitschko is building the bridge as soon as it's bombed it's our bridge you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's always like this so yes we love it you yeah. know uh, and we so, love all those imperfections yes this, this and so makes us ukrainians what i want to talk about also is what you've been doing as the war has been going on um and this is going to turn us to the actual topic of this event tonight as we're half an hour in which is which is this practice of writing so you've been leading what you call online therapeutic writing courses could you explain to us a bit what these courses look like who who is attending them and what are you writing in them Oh, this is the great thing, because as uh, many people, I was going crazy at the beginning of the war. Uh, like you can just to, to picture it, like if, if you have five dogs who, who run five different directions, these are your thoughts and your intentions. And you don't know who you have to help kids or homeless animals or army or like, should you go to this TV channel to explain or to this one? Or should you just write some posts for Ukraine? So like it was crazy and people had a um, uh, tremendous survivor guilt also whoever left even because mostly uh, women with children who left you know from ukraine uh, women with no children stayed or even women with children stayed like luba here because her husband is there so she couldn't uh, she she didn't want to leave anyway i saw people they were losing themselves and then i discovered for myself that even if i write a couple of uh, you know a couple of lines i was feeling good I, I felt like okay this day was not just lived in vain so i talked to to my shrink and she said yes actually it works like this so i thought like what if i do therapeutic writing so like to fight fear to fight guilt to fight your anxiety you know to fight the fear of future because sometimes it's not it's not even your guilt it's it's an anger towards someone you know because like people are being ashamed by other ones you know like they they're like um culpabilize culpabilize yeah that's great for, yeah yeah so like you know uh, by others and basically that was to teach them to see the enemy clearly that's just russian's fault you know it's not the fault of your neighbor or someone else so technically i had a, i had a course online and i had over 400 members joining wow. And so there were women mostly from all around the world. And we actually, what we did, like I found it such a great irony because a part of the income, uh, we bought weapons for for ukrainian wow. special forces yeah. so like it was therapy for ukrainians in both ways you yeah. know like for mental health and yeah. for like physical and yes. and this is a great point to turn back to artem when we're speaking about kind of these two forms of therapy there's the form of writing and then there's this active resistance which is artem what you've done by actually joining the armed forces um and what's interesting is that so 
you are engaged in these daily military practices, but you've also said recently in an interview that you tried at the start of this to keep a war diary and that you've stopped, that you haven't been able to write. And so with Irena, we see that writing has, has been this form of therapy, this form of catharsis, which has helped her process. For you, has, it, has that been your experience? Are you able to write? Have you written since, since you became engaged in, this, in military practices? Artem, can you hear us? Um, I think you're muted, Artem. Once again, I'm really sorry for the bad connection. Yeah, unfortunately, with me, it was the, the another thing. And I was starting, starting, I was, yes, I can hear you, but I'm afraid you cannot hear me. Yes, yes we can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, after a few months, I stopped writing because, uh, you know, when you're in the army, it becomes this routine and uh, it becomes very difficult to just find time for writing first. And uh, war is not like uh, all uh, all that you see in the in the. It's not like what you see in the, in the videos. In the videos, you 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 usually see the peak experiences. And here, when you're just serving, it's like one day resembles another very much. And so for, for now, I cannot really write because like I don't have enough input, you know? I'm just like uh, always in my own thoughts and in my own, um, I don't know, just uh, day by day routine, it, it, it takes a lot of time and you don't really uh, have much time left to write. And, uh, uh, I would even say it's not about time, it's about energy. You don't have enough energy because you have to be very mentally active in order to uh, in order to be able to write. So I am on hold right now, but I'm hoping that like after victory, after this all ends, I will be able to write because I have a lot of things to say, but some things are not timely and that's it. And do you miss writing? Uh, of course, I miss writing. Yeah, everything else you can do. Everything else, like I even started going to a gym and stuff like that. But writing is uh, uh, the thing that I m miss most now. But at the moment, I can't even read. Uh, I think that's because uh, you know you have too much, too many emotions and too many thoughts that always distract you. And ideally, yeah, it would be perfect to just direct all this. Uh, in, into into writing, but uh, at the moment I can't find just mental forces for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to turn to Yuba as well, who's also obviously helped us um, understand this, the conflict of language, the problem of language, using language to describe war, using language when war is happening. Yuba, I want to um, cite one of your poems. This is from the poem Decomposition. It's beautiful. Um, I really highly recommend this entire book of poetry, but you write, there's no poetry about war, just decomposition. Only letters remain, and they all make a single sound. And in another poem, you write, language never keeps up with life. So I want to ask you how you think that poetry and language more broadly can contend with the reality of war. Um, Artem uh, already mentioned uh, that um, this um, feeling uh, when you cannot even uh, read uh, during war. I totally understand it. And um, I can say that uh, uh, there are some competition between reality and uh, between stories, between literature. And uh, uh, war um, language us usually reflects life. And uh, during war, uh, their language is changing all the, all the time. And also it's um, like emotionally hard uh, to write and uh, about war and to read something else because stories uh, around us, uh, uh, they are uh, more interesting. They are uh, sometimes sh uh, shocking for us and uh, uh, then literature. Yeah, there are some kind of competition. This is third things. And uh, I tried to um, resolve, uh, to, to find a solution for uh, my writing. And this is, was uh, before this full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And uh, I understood that I can um, 
use also language uh, to uh, to express uh, this uh, uh, this war situation and i uh, decomposed words to describe the composition of cities and towns uh, this material decomposition or, or mental decomposition sometimes uh, in these poems uh, you already quoted uh, i sometimes i use uh, some um, name names uh, of ukrainian cities as uh, uh, donetsk and uh, I, uh, I decompose uh -huh. my friends are held hostage and i can't read them i can't do do netsk um, which is obviously decomposing this word donetsk which is a place yeah, like yeah. this is donetsk and donetsk yeah it work uh, it works like this yes and um <clears throat> Yeah, I am trying to work in this way, and but we have actually we have lots of uh, new things uh, which happens with language. This is inflation of the words. We cannot use uh, a lot of time uh, one word, and uh, uh, we can use it, of course. But then we will see that there are kind of uh, there is kind of inflation of these words like a war. Uh, because uh, this word uh, is becoming meaningful for us here. Uh, this like normal word, it, it isn't uh, terrifying or so, so on. This, is be this word became just normal word for us, like a table, like a room and so on. Uh, also, um, I mentioned about idioms. Uh, language uh, became uh, like more direct we cannot use a bunch of metaphors or so on uh, because it uh, looks ugly and uh, we need to deal with this uh, language and uh, this uh, reality situation and uh, i am just trying to find uh, ways how to deal with it do you, do you of course um, as yeah. a form of resistance yeah. or protest I'll repeat myself. Do you see poetry as a form of protest or resistance? Um, I'm not sure that poet literature, that literature can be a form of uh, protest. It can be a form of interaction with this audience to explain or, or to share some thoughts, uh, to share some experience or feelings, uh, which we have uh, this, uh, I believe, uh, uh, People in Ukraine uh, have this additional value uh, because we have like new for uh, another word experience. How and we trying to understand how to deal with this uh, war situation in Ukraine. Well, it's, it's, and uh, with, with it, it isn't actually a protest for me. You know, it's like ch exchanging or so on. Yes. Amazing. I mean, it's just like Irena was saying, it can also be a therapeutic process. You can use it to understand what your experience is and unpack it. Um, and I think poetry is such kind of a, a potent source of dealing with one's experience, understanding what it is. There is kind of the converse side to this, which we're going to quickly, quickly talk about because time is, is going very fast. But I want to turn back to Alessa really quickly um, because you are also a historian of war and something that you've written about has been witnessing this dissonance in these academic settings between um, academics who are speaking about war but have no actual personal relation to it and this experience of living through war and feeling responsible for speaking about it truthfully. So I have two questions for you and you have to answer them very fast and they're, they're, they're intense ones. But um, first of all, I wanna know if no you pressure. think- <laughs> If you think that the intellectualization of war in some way diminishes its reality, and if that is the case, I want to know how we can productively study and discuss war when it happens. Gosh, I'll probably do the usual thing and not answer those questions, but answer something related to that that I've been thinking about. Um, but those are great questions, and I'll keep thinking about them. So, no, of course we need to study wars. How else are we going to find out about lived experience of, of the people who go through them? Um, and we need to study them in, such, in, in new ways to reflect our needs to understand. So, for instance, one of the things that I've been doing is I've, before the start of 
Russia's war in Ukraine before 2014, I was researching participation of women in the Second World War. And for me, it was really important not to just see that as a women's specific experience, as but also participation, active participation as service women, but also active participation of service women as an integral way to understand the nature of war. Not something you put on a shelf where it says women's studies, right? But something you put on a shelf where, where, where we want to find out more about war. So we need to look for ways, and academics are good at that. You know, We're good at expanding our techniques and methods and knowledge. The challenge that I found being the scholar of war and also then experiencing personal loss, so having my brother killed at the front line, was how do I marry vulnerability and grief and still be objective and neutral and all of those things that I expected of scholars. And I, I was really confused. I didn't know what to do. And I had to decide very quickly what to do because I was in the middle of teaching and going to conferences where people talked about war. And then I didn't, I didn't um, tell people that my brother had died, um, but people started to find out. And every time, you know, uh, families of lost soldiers or fallen soldiers were mentioned, people would look at me in the room aha she's one of them really? and kind of you know I sort of assume that people will start to perceive me through that and therefore not as a proper scholar and at one point I thought well no actually it doesn't work like that vulnerability is part of our experience so is rage so is everything else and we need to and we, and we need to use it effectively to communicate about this war right and that's what i started to do um and we need to yeah we need to be honest I so yeah my method is honesty that's that's such a fantastic way to end this conversation to say that methods of vulnerability rage and honesty because i think that characterizes all of your writing um and i can't stress enough how beautiful the writing of all of these authors is so i highly encourage you to look into it but um could we have a big round of applause and We are very quickly going to turn to questions, um, but before we do that on the subject of vulnerability, rage, honesty, and wielding these in productive ways, I want to quickly show a recording um, of Yuba. If, for those who don't know in the audience, Yuba performed at the Grammys this past year with John Legend as part of a tribute to Ukraine. Um, she read her poem, Prayer, and it is incredibly moving. Um, so I'd really like for us to watch that tonight and then we'll turn to questions. And maybe if we could turn the lights down, but if not, no worries. <laughs> Our Father, heart in heaven, of the full moon and the hollow sun, shield from death my parents whose house stands in the line of fire and who won't abandon it like a tomb. Our daily bread give to the hungry and let them stop devouring one another and forgive us our destroyed cities even though we do not forgive for them our enemies shoot and protect my husband my parents my child and my motherland oh no. i think it's wonderful Um, we'll now open the floor up to questions. So does anyone in the audience have any questions? Uh, these lights are really hard to, there we go. Yes, any raised hands? Yes, someone right in the front, very easy. Um, hello, uh, I have two questions um, for Alessia. Um, I missed the beginning, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, just a question about uh, British people. How, yeah, their perception changed since the war the perception of ukrainians because well myself living in uh, france and uh, i lived in uh, in london as well so i can compare and um, i know this experience of justifying myself over time explaining who i am again so i experienced it as well so how it changed in, in um, i don't know in london it's a bit special I don't know about the, the whole Great Britain, how it changed because, um, well, we experienced it in France and I'd like to know how it was, uh, well, overseas. <laughs> yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, great, great question. I, I can't generalize about all British people. I can only share some, some of my own observations. Uh, and I am mostly in London, so I do travel around the country a bit, uh, but, but not, not that much. Um, so I would, the few things I would say that they are very open, they were, they were very, very open to receiving Ukrainian dis Ukrainians displaced by this war. Um, they really opened their hearts and, 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 and homes, and they were really frustrated that the government uh, sort of exercised the strategic Incompetence, incompetence and did, created quite a lot of obstacles for Ukrainians to actually arrive, which wasn't the case in the EU. Um, now we have quite a lot of Ukrainian uh, refugees in the UK and you know people have been extremely supportive and that's great. Another thing that I notice in comparison with some of the countries that I visit outside of the UK is that they are very willing to admit that they are ignorant about Ukraine. So they'll come to talks and they'll say, actually, I know nothing about the country. I didn't know anything up until the until February, can you recommend what I should read? You know, and they, they are really willing to expand the knowledge and to, uh, to discover Ukraine. And um, one thing, that, the last thing I'd like to say is there's been a lot of what I call situational interest because of Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. People started to pay attention. And I saw that in cultural institutions, for instance, in the UK, lots of museums and uh, concert hall halls and so on wanted to do a Ukraine fundraiser, a big event and so on. And now I really want to see that turn into structural change. That is not a one-off thing that we've ticked off and we say, okay, we've done our Ukraine thing, right? That, that, that understanding, improved understanding of Ukraine transforms into lasting relationships with the country. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, do we have any more questions in the audience? Yes, I see someone in the back. Oh, we need it for Zoom, unfortunately. <laughs> Would it be possible for the library to put something up on the website that tells us up about the speakers today and the works that they have done so that we can have more access to that? I hate to take the time of you people. I'd love to hear you talk, but I'd like to have the library do it. Yes. <laughs> any other questions? Anyone at all? Uh, do we have any questions on Zoom, perhaps? If not, I have lots more, so no worries. Yes, awesome. All right, there's two of us here at least. Anyone else with any other questions in the audience? We also have some scholars of Ukraine here present. My colleagues, Irina Skolkina from Lviv here and Olena Falko as well, who's uh, from um, Shepetivka from Ukraine. <laughs> um, just pointing it out. There's lots of um, knowledge in this room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yes, our own programs manager, Alice McCrum has a question. You mentioned um, that people ask you what literature you would refer them to. Can you tell us what Ukrainian is? <laughs> Oh. Where, where where should we go to, to learn, apart from all of your writing? Gladly, but can we all share some? Maybe we could be restricted to two pieces. That would be of, uh, two, because I can obviously go for a whole list. I'll give you two names. Um, and these are just my favoritist and see what the others say. But there's so many more. Oh, agony. So, um, Fadi Siekler, uh, Lesa Ukrainka. You'll remember because it means Ukrainian woman, Lesa Ukrainka. Read anything and everything by her. There's some excellent translations, new translations. Uh, email me, I'll send you. Um, and the contemporary writer from Donetsk, uh, Olena Stashkina. Olena Stashkina, who writes, who has written a lot about this war. And just, I, I love her prose. Um, and there's so many more. Irena, what about, what about you? Who are your two authors? Recommend to read Serhii Plohi who writes directly in English. It's uh, fascinating the way that he explains Ukrainian history. Yes, it's a historian, but he's doing it like in a thriller way, you know, so like you really want to read it. This is the, the great gift. And again, you know, I love so many Ukrainian authors you have already here. This You, you will have the possibility to read um, Artem Chapai. You could hear already Luba Yakimchuk. Sonia, I'm, I want to read you myself, of course. And, and your book I haven't read yet. And and uh, one of my favorites is uh, Taras Prohasko. I don't know if he's translated yet or not, because we actually need so many more translations because there are new authors and old authors you know like people who you want to discover and like Teresa Lutkovska who lives in Greece and it's a very nice if you like Elizabeth Stroud for example it's kind of the same tempo you know like because some some authors are not even known in Ukraine but for God's sake they're so great and brilliant yeah 
I'd, I'd love to turn these to um, our participants on Zoom as well, but I worry that we won't be retaining these names. So I'm going to ask you all to write these down for me at the end of the night and I'll send this out to everyone involved. Um, if there are no more questions in the room, <laughs> I have I have one more question that I'd like to ask um, to all of these participants, but maybe we could start with Sonia and then turn to Artem and Yuba because they've perhaps not spoken as much as those of us physically present. Um, I'm sure you're asked, I knew you're asked very frequently about the future, the future of the war, the future of Ukraine, the future of Ukrainian literature. Um, and what I'd love to know, a bit of a mean question, but A, kind of what this term future has come to mean for you, if you believe in it, if you think that it's possible to envision it, and B, if that is the case, what you think this future is, um, the question that everyone else asks you. So I'd, I want to start with Sonia, and then we'll turn to the other two on Zoom as well. That's a complex question. Thank you, Emily. Um, I guess I'll just say, well, maybe specifically about Ukrainian literature, as I think towards the future, I'm really interested to see how um, Ukrainians' relationship with the natural world is going to be depicted in the literature of the future, right, as Putin and the Russian army commits genocide and ecocide, right? These sort of like dual tragedies that are almost indistinguishable or interlocking in some way. Um, I'm interested to see how depictions of relations between human life and non-human life on Ukrainian territory will sort of like develop and evolve in Ukrainian literature. I guess that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. That's a fantastic answer because that brings us directly to Artem who has written um, a book, a short story called Erosion Weathering, which is exactly about kind of this ecological devastation of Ukraine as well. And Artem, you've said that when you begin writing again, you might be interested, for example, in writing science fiction. The work you've just completed is in part dystopian. So what do you think the future of Ukrainian writing is and what is the future of your writing? Uh, yeah, in general, I was uh, I'm sometimes afraid to write uh, specu uh, speculative fiction because too often it comes true. Like my last work, which was written in 2021, is basically about Ukraine, about after war or after a disaster, after something happens, something like uh, an unnamed disaster. And um, so, uh, as to the future of Ukraine in general, I would like to say that. Um, this is a great tragedy, but we are now having a unique chance. And that is why Ukrainians are not going to give up ever, because we are now having a unique chance where when we are we are fighting, but we are helped by the world. And I think most Ukrainians uh, really value it. I was going to say about uh, one thing uh, like. I never, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about uh, my favorite authors. I've discovered a new poet now, and I want you to remember that name, Pavlo Vishababa. He is a poet who started basically writing now during the war, and he's writing from the trenches, and he's writing poems which are like about everyone, about us. It's, uh, uh, I was always thinking that I'm kind of, deaf to poetry, but his poetry, Pavlova Shababa, just remember that name, that's the future of Ukrainian poetry, I think. I hope, well, okay. Um, so that, that's what, that's what I'm, that's what I wanted to say. As to my own writing, it's like not a matter of such, so, so much importance. <laughs> I'm sure there are people here who would disagree with that, but thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time now. I want to just quickly, quickly turn to Luba and ask her if she would like to share any last thoughts about the very big question of the future of Ukrainian literature. Yuba, what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, I believe the uh, um, future of UK Ukrainian literature depends on the situation on the front line. And uh, uh, there are like um, very strong connection between a, a Ukrainian culture and uh, uh, geopolitics, and uh, I believe uh, uh, we will prevail in this war. And uh, uh, future of Ukrainian literature is, uh, I, I believe it, it will be very good. And also we have uh, here in a chat in our chat uh, one more question about 
a future of Ukrainian language. And I also want to say that a future or like of Ukrainian language also will be great because now lots of people in Ukraine uh, switched their language from Russian into Ukrainian. And this is uh, like common situation in Ukraine uh, right now because uh, we feel all Russia, uh, all everything, what is connected with Russia, with Russian things, we feel it like disgusting. This is like kind of psycho um, physiologi physiological reaction. Uh, it makes us stomach turn because uh, it's very stressful for us, for us and dangerous. And uh, people uh, decided to, to switch uh, their language because of this uh, disgust, what we feel now in Ukraine during this shelling under our heads. Uh, so I believe everything will be like, is going how it should should be but yeah everything is going as it should thank you so much you have a Irena really quickly wants to share something yeah yes. I like it. it's about the future of literature I'm always interested in good texts mm -hmm. and new voices so yes. like the continuing of my therapeutic writing right yes. now um, about hundreds of women authors they write stories about their experience during this war mm -hmm. I have volunteers I have militaries I have moms I mean agree with their kids so and in, in, in the end I really want to publish this collection yeah Yes. of true stories written by non-professional authors but who know maybe we will discover some new stars and i really hope so well next mm -hmm. season at the american library in paris we'll be hosting lots of authors who have written about their experience of this war could i Thank say a word about the future just to yes encourage you have all 30 seconds yes. 30 seconds <laughs> uh planning for the future is a privileged position and ukrainians are not in that privileged position right now but they have such a clear vision of the future uh, and that's what they're fighting for. And that's why I'd like to encourage all of us to ensure that we do everything we can to make sure that Ukraine achieves victory and it achieves it soon.